For the third and final lecture of physical properties, we're going to go into mechanical physical properties today. Mechanical properties. These are the properties that are primarily concerned with how a mineral breaks its strength and its resilience. These are properties that are controlled by the bonding and the style of bonding that a mineral has. We get to worry about things like um, strain and force and stress as we go into these physical properties. We're going to talk about how a mineral breaks and hardness are the biggest two principles. And then at the end, we'll get into mass and other unusual things, I guess. So to start off, let's talk about how a mineral breaks or ways a mineral breaks. There's three main ways that a mineral breaks. Probably the most important to learn here is going to be the concept of breakage along cleavage planes. All right? So this is called cleavage. Cleavage is the tendency of a mineral to break along planes of weak bonding. That's our official definition. Tendency of a mineral to break along planes of weak bonding. So it is an actual bonding control on the mineral breaking, okay? And there are a variety of different ways that we can describe cleavage with different adjectives. We talk about the quality, we talk about the quantity, and we talk about the directionality of cleavage breaking. So directions. Quality is adjectives like good, poor, perfect. Oh, perfect's a really important one because sometimes minerals do have a perfect cleavage. When it breaks with a perfect cleavage, we get these really shiny and smooth uh, breaks that look almost exactly like crystal faces. You can also have poor cleavage when the mineral doesn't really want to break, but it can. Quantity refers to how many directions how many directions of cleavage. So it can be one, two, or three. And this is defined by like um, one direction of cleavage would be like this, two directions of cleavage would be like this, and three directions of cleavage might be something, ah, I did this bad, might be something like an octahedron, like this, one, two, and three, and they all like intersect with one another. And then the um, ah, directions, maybe we should have said something like angles. Angles is what I meant by direction. You can have cleavage planes that intersect at 90 degrees or 60, 120 degrees. And let me show you what I mean in the form of a schematic from a textbook. This is not actually from our textbook, although our textbook has one that's very similar to this. Here we see um, a mica crystal like muscovite. It has one cleavage direction. It's perfect. It makes a very smooth, shiny um, face, but it's only in one direction like this. Here we have a prismatic cleavage with two cleavage directions, right? One and two here with the arrows, and they intersect one another at 90 degrees. When a mineral breaks this way, it tends to break into prisms, and so we could use an adjective like prismatic perfect cleavage to describe this. This example is the exact same in that there are two directions of perfect cleavage, but the angle between them, this is hornblende, so it has an angle of around 60 and 120. Here's a couple more different examples. Cubic cleavage has 90 degree in three directions. That's how halite breaks. Calcite breaks with perfect rhombohedral cleavage. Fluorite, when it grows in crystal form, it actually grows as a cube. But when it breaks, the cube falls apart. And instead what we get are little octahedrons of fluorite. Okay, so that's cleavage. There's another way that a mineral can break with some kind of like systematic tendency, and it's called parting. So little two is parting, and parting is in response to like structural deformation, like maybe from some metamorphic type environment, and that deformation creates um, weaknesses in the crystal that can allow the crystal to break. So let's put the definition first. It's a systematic but irregular breaking along structural weaknesses. So it's not inherent to the mineral itself, but it has been imposed by some kind of structural deformation that's made the mineral weaker, and you will get uh, planes 
of breaking that occur. Maybe we should say something like, um, uh, let's just put like the word deformation here. And let's also put the word defects here. These are the things that allow for parting breakages. And I'm going to show you a picture of corundum. These are, this is the ruby variety of corundum. When it grows in nature, it forms these real beautiful hexagonal bipyramids shown here. But if we were to hit this with a hammer, we would probably see it break perpendicular to the long axis of the crystal, forming parting planes. They look like cleavage planes. Look how smooth and shiny that surface is. It's, it's very regular looking. It's not controlled by the bonding. Instead, it's controlled by deformation. Okay. And what you'll need to do, like how can you tell the difference between parting and cleavage? The answer is uh, you can't. You're going to need um, to learn by experience. Need to learn the difference. Learn by experience. No one's going to expect you to be able to recognize the difference between parting and cleavage uh, just out of hand. You need it by experience. The third type of way a mineral breaks is called fracture. And fracture is just irregular breaking. Fracture is irregular. There are different ways fracture breaking can occur. There's adjectives for this. There is conchoidal fracture. This is how glass breaks. So we have a lot of experience with that conchoidal um, breaking pattern. We could almost draw it. It's like it, you kind of get these like curved uh, scoop-like kind of fractures. Um, here's, an, here's what I'm trying to draw, for example. Here's the side. This is a quartz crystal. Quartz breaks with conchoidal fracture. And you'll get this kind of scoop-like irregular breaking pattern. There are other types of ways they can break. Splintery is a good word for some kind of fractures. You can have hackily fracture. That's when it's like really reg irregular. So metals will break with a hackily fracture. Fibrous materials, kind of like wood, will b break with a splintery type of fracture. And fracture gets this irregular breaking. All right, we're going to call it regular breaking. And the main reason is the bonds are equal strength in all directions. That's how we're going to at least uh, think about it for this class. Bonds are approximately, approximately equal in all directions. So I encourage you to start thinking about the minerals that you're interacting with in the systematic portion of mineralogy classes with how they break. And start, start to recognize the difference between, oh, this is another real trick. How can you tell that that's not a crystal face, a cleavage plane, or a parting plane? Like it's really hard. These look like crystal faces, but they're not. They're all cleavage faces. And so that's, again, that's just something that takes practice to recognize the difference between the two. You don't need to be able to just do it out of hand. Our next main topic, so that is how minerals break. That was A, right? Yeah, so, so then B here is going to be mineral hardness. Mineral hardness. Specifically, this means resistance to scratching. And there are minerals that are incredibly soft that you can scratch with your fingernail. And there's other minerals that are so hard you can't even really damage them. And so, uh, so resistance to scratching on a smooth surface. And this is controlled by the weakest bond. So it's, it is a, so controlled by the weakest bond. We know diamond is the hardest mineral, right? You've probably all heard that before. Well, it has incredibly strong covalent bonds between carbons and carbon. Uh, that's the same in every direction, essentially. And so it is a very hard mineral. We organize mineral hardness, and we have for almost 200 years, using something called the Mohs Hardness Scale. I expect you to have this memorized to heart. Uh, it, it was developed in 1824. That's why we said we've been using it for like 200 years. And in short, let's see, how do we do this? Let's go ahead and put a picture in. And I want, this is from the textbook. I want you just to go ahead and like draw this in your notes. It's not a hard uh, drawing to make. Basically, we have most hardness scale that goes from 10 to 1. And the y-axis, you can just ignore. Just call it hard up at the top 
and soft at the bottom, right? You don't need to know absolute hardness. So we have, oh, whoa, we're glitching out. We're glitching out massively. And what we want to do is you want to write down, I want you to have memorized that our scale of one, two, what's happening? Oh, I was drawing in shapes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The graph shows that the relationship is logarithmic. So it's not a linear relationship. But the softest mineral that exists is talc. You can it feels like soap in your hand. It breaks apart so easily. Uh, number two is gypsum. You can scratch this with your fingernail because right in here at about 2.5, that's where your fingernail. And and gypsum, well, what do I want to say here? Gypsum is clear. It is non-metallic. It looks like so many other different minerals. But if you start testing the hardness of quartz and barite and gypsum and halite, you can start to identify the minerals. Number three, you need to know this, is calcite. Number four, is fluorite. It's just a relative scale to, to pin things in with some sort of organization. Five is apatite. You're going to learn all these minerals later in the semester. Orthoclase is number six. Orthoclase has a synonym. It's called potassium feldspar. So it'd be okay to use either one of those terms for this. Number seven is such a f common mineral. Quartz. Eight the gemstone of Texas, topaz nine, is corundum. These are exceptionally hard minerals now. And then last in the scale is diamond. So please do know that in that order, and we are going to use it to identify minerals. Moving on, moving on. Let's go into, this is actually going to be Roman numeral four. I think it's better to call this one properties related to mass. Mass is talked about in two different ways in mineralogy. We sometimes refer to a mineral's density, and the density is the mass of the mineral divided by the volume it takes up. And this is expressed in two ways, either as grams per centimeter cubed or kilograms per meter cubed. We all have a sense for density. We pick up a rock and we're like, oh, this is heavy or oh, this is pretty light. And most of the time that's in reference to like water, which has a density of 1000 kilograms per meter cubed. And a general rock like a granite that you pick up might be like 2700 kilograms per meter cubed. And when things feel really lighter than that 2700, oh, we know that it's a low density mineral. If it's heavier than that, then it's a really high density mineral. And so this idea of how things are related to water, this feeling of heaviness, is also known as specific gravity. So let's go ahead and put this in. We're going to go specific gravity. Sometimes this is called heft. Sometimes this is called feeling of heaviness, right? How heavy does it feel in your hand, right? It's a perception that you, the user, has. But specific gravity also has uh, some, okay, so let's just go here. Specific gravity, S dot G. Sometimes it's only given that acronym. I hate acronyms, but S dot G is sometimes in textbooks. And what it is, it's the density of your mineral divided by density of water. And what ends up happening is when you, because you're um, dividing density by density, the units cancel out. And so you get a unitless number. Uh, how could I say this? So if we do quartz, so let's do an example, the specific gravity S dot G dot of quartz. Well, the, the density of quartz is 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed. Oh, you see how I did that? 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed instead of 2,700. All right, we're just doing some unit conversions. Divided by the density of water, 1.0 grams per centimeter cubed, equals a specific gravity of 2.7, right? No units. We can put some other materials on here, something like ice, it floats on water, which means it must be lighter than water, and it has a specific gravity of 0 0.91. Uh, what's something heavy? Oh, gold and galena. These are good. Galena is a mineral you're going to love because it has a super easy chemical formula of PBS, but the lead makes it really heavy, and it has a specific gravity of 
0.6. Gold, so heavy, right? And gold has a specific gravity of 19.3. It's 19 times heavier than water. And so what does that mean for like geologic research or geologic and geology and the economy? Well, we can use things. Here's a emerald miner working in Colombia where this woman has taken gravels, the bare emerald, and has poured it in, in this chute, and she's pouring water over the material. Lighter material is going to get washed away farther, and the dense emerald crystals are going to concentrate here, right? This is the equivalent of panning for gold. So what this person may find if they were, I guess this, these are garnets, right? So this person is in this example, they have panned for garnets, and the garnet is getting concentrated because garnet, oh, I did, I wrote it down. Garnet has a specific gravity of 3.5, which is greater than the specific gravity of quartz, which is 2.7. And so by using water and panning back and forth, you can concentrate the heavies together. Now, to finish off this lecture, I just want to list off I guess this will even be, what was that? Was that four? So this is Roman numeral five. This is other properties. These are things that most minerals don't have, but if you find it, uh, bless your lucky stars, because you can identify something super easy or easily. Some minerals are magnetic, like magnetite. So if you put a magnet on it, boom, the magnet sticks. Identification is easy. Smell. Mostly the sulfides will have that rotten egg smell. And if you smell that rotten egg smell, you know you're dealing with sulfide and you are closer to your identification. Uh, taste, I wouldn't recommend tasting your minerals, but something like halite um, has a distinct salty taste. So does sylvite, for example, it has a bitter taste. But we're going to try not to do this, at least in my class, okay? And then let's just go D feel. Sometimes minerals are soft or hard and you can like just touch the mineral and know what it is. So talc, for example, is uh, greasy. And just by the feeling of touch, you can learn to identify minerals. Well, that's it. That's all of our physical properties. I hope you can use them effectively to identify minerals.